name mrs xyz of age 26 years hailing from kengeri she is a housewife who is educated up to 12th standard her husband same as mr abc of 30 years of age he works as a bus conductor lmp is 5 12 and 2021 and edd is 12 9 she is a primary driver uh, her gestation age is 25 weeks 4 days the the lady came for her regular antenatal checkup and was found to have high blood sugars blood sugar levels on evaluation for history of presenting preg- present pregnancy first trimester the pregnancy was detected by urine pregnancy test and following 40 days of missed period history of con- spontaneous conception first trimester scan was done and was found to be normal trimester scans were done a uh, total weight gain in first trimester was 1.5 kg folic acid tablets were taken there was no history of burning menstruation fever with rash excess excessive vomiting spotting or bleeding per vagina no history of pain abdomen exposure to radiation or traumatic oh, oh yeah. what are the things you see in first trimester scan is it mandatory for all uh ma'am in first trimester scan if you do a nuchal translucency scan and also a, a dating scan ma'am okay a viability a viability scan is done at 5 uh, to 6 weeks and a uh, a check scan is done at 5 to 6 weeks and a viability scan is done at 6 to 8 weeks and you want to expose the patient uh, so many times what is alara principle oh uh, ma'am a single scan can be done instead of two like a check scan and a viability scan a single scan can be done so It's, yeah uh, so when will you call for a scan then Ma'am, from the at the first antenatal visit, you can do an ultrasound uh, scan if from five to eight weeks to confirm the. If you do, if you do a scan at five weeks, will you be able to uh, see the fetal pole and cardiac activity? Uh, no, ma'am, but you can uh, uh, confirm whether or not it's an ectopic pregnancy. So, what is the main aim of doing your dating scan or first early pregnancy scan? what do you what do you want to know from the first scan of the pregnancy from from the first scan we can confirm the pregnancy we can rule out molar pregnancy um, you rule out molar pregnancy with the first scan see first scan you can confirm the pregnancy whether it is intrauterine or not how will you confirm an intrauterine pregnancy when you see a sac inside the uterus when you see no other sacs i mean like in the tubes or uh, in the i mean other than the uterus then you confirm it is intrauterine gestation and you have to see the fetal pole with the cardiac activity to confirm whether it is a live intrauterine gestation or not okay and the next thing you can see is whether you can uh, i mean you can uh, confirm whether it is a single uh, gestation or it is a twin gestation and the next most thing you have to see is whether it whether the chorio decidual reaction is good whether there are any uh, subchorionic uh, hemorrhages and all okay yes. and for sub, in very early pregnancy it is very hard to dif- differentiate uh, molar pregnancies but as the pregnancy goes on you can diagnose molar pregnancies but not in the very early gestation not at 5 6 weeks at least okay so you want to see everything like you want to know whether it is in, that is intrauterine you want to know whether the fetal pole has formed you want to know whether the cardiac activity is present so when the gestational sac will be there in the scan at what gestational age you expect a gestational sac mom gestational sac okay, generally if the patient if the patient missed period and her upt is positive just at four weeks or some see after four weeks upt can be positive upt can be positive if the blood uh, beta uh, beta hcg is more than 25 milli international units per ml so as soon as she is uh, positive for the uh, pregnancy test you will do a scan no ma'am like as soon as it's positive you, you might not get just you won't get gestational sac but like at eight weeks if you do a scan you can see the gestational sac no at 5 weeks you can see a gestational sac okay so if you if you talk in terms of uh, beta hcg if the beta hcg is more than 1500 international units milli, milli international units per ml 
then obviously you have to see a gestational tract through a transvaginal ultrasound. So a transvaginal ultrasound can pick up a gestational sac at five weeks, okay? And yolk sac generally appears at five plus uh, five weeks, five days. And cardiac fetal pole will appear at six weeks. And by six plus two weeks, you can expect cardiac activity also, okay? Yes. And yeah, amniotic sac, everything will, will be formed at around seven weeks. So you, you, if you do a scan at five weeks, you have to repeat a scan after two weeks or one week to see the cardiac activity and fetal pole appearance, okay? So, but if it is an uneventful pregnancy, when will you call for an early pregnancy scan? Ideally at around eight weeks, okay? At eight weeks, you expect a fetal pole to be there and to uh, fetal heart can be measured, fetal heart rate can be measured by M mode and you can rule out any other abnormalities present, okay? So there is no point of, no specific indication to do an early pregnancy scan at around five weeks or six weeks unless until you suspect anything. Unless until the patient lands up with bleeding and all, or if there is any prior history of ectopic, prior history of more, some abnormality, miscarriages and all, there is no point of doing at five to six weeks for uh, as a routine scan. Okay, even gen, even uh, strictly speaking, uh, early pregnant and early pregnancy scan has specific indications. You can go through your Williams and see what are the indications for early pregnancy scan. Okay, so early pregnancy scan will you have to do a single scan and you have to rule out everything. So for that, you better do it around seven to eight weeks. Okay? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yeah, fine. And then when will you do your NT scan? Ma'am, mucal translucency 11 to 13 weeks plus six days. Yes. So what do you want to see then? Ma'am, uh, rule out Down syndrome, uh, anencephaly. And carefully, very good. Yeah, so you can rule out and carefully, and you can uh, see you can I mean, like see Down syndrome. You can't diagnose Down syndrome as such, but you can screen for Down syndrome through NT scan. So you have done NT scan, and you I mean, can you I mean, like, can you tell uh, with I mean, like, what is the sensitivity and specificity of NT scan in screening for uh, Down syndrome? Can you rely only on NT scan for the screening? No, ma'am, but um, for that you can do and. Um, what is the role of double marker? I'm, I'm not sure Have you heard of double marker? No. Okay. So, and what are the investigations you can offer for trisomy screening? Yes, trisomy screening, NT scan alone cannot screen, uh, I mean, like, is not very efficacious in screening Down syndrome. You have to do a double marker or in first trimester or a quadruple marker in second trimester to be uh, more specific in screening the Down syndrome or any other. You know, I mean, like, what are the other trisomies you can rule out? Trisomy 13, 18, and 21. Okay? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah, okay then, fine. You're fourth year student, right? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so you, you have been posted in gynec thing, but you have not started with uh, gynec classes and all, right? Theory classes are started? Yes, ma'am. Okay, okay, fine, yeah. Please go, next slide. Second trimester, okay. weakening was felt at 5th month and continued to perceive feet movements well. Uh, so what, the, what is the role of weakening here? What do you infer from this quickening point? Ma'am, the development of the fetus and the viability. See, why is it important in the first trimester dating scan to accurately date your pregnancy? Because it everything you plan further depends on the dating of the pregnancy, right? Depending yes. on the gestational age, okay? In older days where, where there is no uh, good enough scan things and all, they, I mean, like quickening also can be used to date the pregnancy. So generally for a primary quickening is felt at 18 weeks, for a multigravida, it is felt two weeks okay. prior also. Okay. So, so quickening is something which everybody remembers. Okay. So mother can tell when she felt the quickening and all. Okay. So this is like uh, an extra point where you can tell that the gestational is, uh, age is as per uh, this thing, calculated one. Okay? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So the quickening point, you have to stress it because it is one of the surrogate parameter to uh, assess the gestational age. Okay? Yes, ma'am. Oral glucose tolerance test concluded high blood sugar levels at 150 milligram percent. 
ultrasound scan was found to be normal two doses so what ultrasound do you order in second trimester ma'am in second trimester it's important to order the targeted anomaly scan ma'am at from 18 to 20 weeks okay okay good so why is it important and when is it done ma'am it's done from 18 to 20 weeks and it detects congenital abnormalities ma'am especially in why it should not be done before 18 weeks why it should not be done after 20 weeks Before eating, I am not sure. Yeah. Is so it because organogenesis would have occurred? So. Yeah, organogenesis must have uh, happened. Major organogenesis must have happened within twelve weeks only. So, but the organ should grow to. I mean, like uh, to see in the scan whether they have real uh, anomalies or not, right? So, anomaly yeah. detection will be more. once you once the gestational age is more but after 20 weeks there is no point in detecting anomalies because mtp act will allow you to do mtp only till 20 weeks okay so that is the reason you have to finish your targeted fetal and uh, survey before 20 weeks so that's the reason they have given it you a two week period from 18 to 20 weeks Yes, okay so any anomaly detection any mtp for anomaly detection should be done before 20 weeks Okay. Yes. Sir. Okay. So, how many doses of TT you will be giving, and um, what is uh, the timing? If if the if in the past three years she has taken a uh, like because of a previous pregnancy she has taken a TT dose, then you will be uh, giving only one dose of TT. That's a booster dose. But if mm -hmm. this is a uh, in this case it is a first pregnancy, so you will be given two doses of TT four weeks apart. Okay. Okay. Good. Okay, so what else is important in second trimester? Ma'am, quickening or uh, an anomaly scan, the uh, starting iron and iron tablets, and um, also from at the first antenatal visit, also blood sugar levels are checked, and even from again in the second trimester, from twenty four to twenty eight weeks, you check do OGTT once more. So, what do you mean by OGTT? Ma'am, oral glucose tolerance test, ma'am. So, what kind of oral glucose tolerance test uh, you did? Is it uh, was it a seventy five grams one or yes, was it a hundred? In uh, in we follow the DIPSI, which is a diabetes and pregnancy study group from India. Okay. According to that, irrespective of the previous meal, you have to give um seventy five grams of oral glucose, and two hours later, a uh, blood sample is withdrawn and checked. So, what do you mean by a tolerance test and a challenge test? So, what is the difference between a challenge test and tolerance test? I'm not sure. See, uh, if you give it, a, if it is not under fasting kind of thing, it can be considered as a challenge test. If it is a fasting and you give glucose overload, then it is a tolerance test. You have seventy five grams glucose tolerance test, hundred grams glucose tolerance test. Dipsy recommends seventy five sure. grams glucose challenge test. We, of course, it is a uh, invariably in. Uh, uh, i mean like they can call it as tolerance test also but it is irrespective of fasting it can be in fasting or it cannot be in fasting that's the reason they refer it as tolerance test but generally challenge tests are done in non fasting status okay yes, and challenge tests are for screening so what are the i mean like we'll discuss it later yeah just go through the next slide obstetric history uh, she's a primary gravida lmp 5 to 11 and edd 12 9 2022 Menstrual history: Menak had attained her thirteen years of age. She had uh, regular cycles at twenty-eight days, plus or minus two days. She had four to five days of flow. She changed about three pads per day, not associated with dysmenorrhea or clots. Past history: There is no history of blood transfusion, surgeries, um, previous history of diabetes, hypertension, tuberculosis, asthma, or thyroid dysfunction. Marital history: Married for twenty years. Married life. Uh, what years, is her age? What was? What is her age? Twenty six years, ma'am. Twenty six years, marriage at twenty years of age. Okay, okay. Family history, nothing significant. Uh, in family history, oh, I what? Also... Oh. Mm, yeah, please. Yes, ma'am. What What did you ask in family history, which is significant to your history? Ma'am, in this, I uh, asked about um, for previous history of diabetes or hypertension or thyroid dysfunction, and also. But you asked in past history also, right? Family history. 
no if uh, in the family if there is any history of diabetes hypertension and also if there are any birth defects or um, twinning in the family okay so how is that important how is that important like uh, past i mean family history of diabetes and family history of twinning or birth defects how is that important ma'am uh, fam it is many of these functions are hereditary so what are hereditary ma'am congenital anomalies and twin twin pregnant uh, history of twinning is can be seen as family ma'am okay and regarding your case your particular case her ogtt was elevated right that was her main complaint yes. so if there is any history of diabetes in the first degree family relatives obviously she will be under high risk for tdm or any over diabetes or whatever it is okay yes for next slide yeah person history a uh, patient follows a mixed diet um, reports a normal appetite has adequate sleep uh, regular bowel and bladder movements there is no history of substance abuse drug allergy or use of contraceptives patient general physical examination patient is conscious cooperative well oriented to time place and person vitals patient is a febrile pulse rate or mention uh, never mention as vitals they are vital signs Okay, okay. they are not okay. just vitals. Okay, achieve, many sir. examiners are not comfortable with this word. Mention it as vital signs. They are signs, vital signs, right? Oh, this one, sir. Patient is a febrile, pulse rate one ten beats per minute, BP one thirty over seventy per milligrams of mercury, millimeters of mercury, uh, respiratory rate sixteen seconds per minute. Pala actual cyanosis clubbing left perineal cathedra is absent. Height so, of the yeah, her BP was one thirty by seventy four, uh, and her pulse rate was one ten. Do you think it is normal? Ma'am, the BP is normal. Ma'am, yeah, it's normal. BP is normal according to guidelines. It is normal, but generally you expect the BP to fall after a second trimester, right? Yes, ma'am. so uh, what is the method uh, like how you check the bp have you followed the guidelines before checking the bp have you given enough rest uh, have you checked the, the bp the patient was in rest and she was not in supine position and when sitting position the bp was taken okay after 15 to 20 minutes of resting right uh, she was in the opd when i took the case so yeah. so generally you have to check ideally you have to check after 15 to 20 minutes of resting and back should be supported and her feet should touch the ground okay 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 yeah okay uh, then fine carry on so her bmi bmi is 24.98 so uh, did you ask her about pre pregnancy weight uh mom this is for pre pregnancy That sixty-eight kg was her pre weight. Uh, yes. Then what? What was her current pregnancy weight? Uh, ma'am, uh, current pregnancy weight. I took. I asked. I took this case before uh, she found out her second trimester. But in first trimester, she had one point five kg. Why is it important? Why I am stressing on pre-pregnancy weight and current pregnancy? Ma'am, that is how you was uh, um, ascertain how much weight gain in the pregnancy is normal. Okay, yes. and. And also excessive weight gain could uh, point towards diabetes. So what? What if she has excess weight gain? What do you? What does it infer? Um, I'm not sure, ma'am. I know that people with high BMI, pre-pregnant high BMI, they gain more weight during pregnancy. See, pre-pregnancy high BMI obviously at risk for diabetes and other pregnancy complications. Uh, and uh, pre pregnancy weight one more main thing is you can calculate your iron requirement if she is for iv sucrose and all but that's not related to your case but weight gain actually weight gain is very important because people who are having more uh, weight gain in uh, second trimester are under risk for gdm and also other other uh, 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 things like pih and all okay yes, so sir. weight gain should how, how much is the ideal weight gain in pregnancy Um, ideal weight gain in pregnancy is eleven to twelve point five kg, ma'am. Okay. Do you expect any weight gain in first trimester? Ma'am, um, first trimester, even if there is no weight gain, it is normal, ma'am. 
Yeah. Hardly some point eight kgs is normal actually. Okay, we don't expect uh, any weight gain in first trimester. It starts in second trimester. Yes. But if there is any drastic or increased weight gain, then you should be cautious and you should think of some complications in pregnancy and you should warn the patient also. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Next. The breast spine and thyroid examination is found to be normal. Systemic examination, abdomen per abdomen inspection, the shape is globular, longitudinally descended, corresponding quadrants move equally with respiration, umbilicus is septal and inverted, linea nigra is present and noted, no scar sinuses dilated veins are seen, um, so hernia orifices are intact, upon palpation there is no local rise in temperature, abdominal girth was at the level of umbilicus was 80 centimeters. There is the fundal height here. Oh, I should measure. Yeah, your fundal height. What are the obstetric grips first? First obstetric grip. What are the obstetric grips? Um, the uh, the Leopold Venomoran first is the fundal grip, then the lateral grip, the first pelvic grip, and the second pelvic grip. Yeah, fundal grip has to be done uh, in all trimesters, right? Uh, I have performed it. I just didn't mention that it corresponds to gestational age. I'm not observing. Okay, okay. Yeah, carry on. Fetal parts are palpable. Uh, then CVS, S1 and S2 heard, no murmurs are heard. Uh, respiratory... Have you uh, auscultated for fetal uh, sounds through uh, with step? No, ma'am, I did not auscultate. Okay. You can write. I don't know Doppler can pick up fetal. A Doppler can pick up a fetal heart rate from uh, fetal sounds from 11 weeks. Yes. And by 20 weeks, you, are, you will be able to uh, hear through step. She's already 25 weeks, right? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Okay. CBS, S1 and S2 word, no murmurs, respiratory, bilateral, normal vascular blood sounds, CNS, no focal neurological deficits noted. Summary, a 26-year-old priming gravida at 25 weeks and 5 days of gestation was found to have high blood sugar levels. She is not a known case of diabetes mellitus. She has taken two doses of TD and has normal findings in obstetric ultrasound scans and is able to perceive weak movements well. She is a booked case. Okay. Uh, a provisional diagnosis, a 26-year-old primary gravidal baby at 25 weeks and 5 days of gestation has, a, has findings suggestive of gestational diabetes. Mellitus. Okay. So tell me the definition of gestational diabetes. Ma'am, gestational diabetes is uh, um, carbohydrate intoler intolerance of varied severity that is first noted in for the first time in present pregnancy. Okay, irrespective of her, whether she's on my, uh, medical nutrition therapy or insulin, whatever it is, if it is first detected in uh, pregnancy, then we label it as GDM, right? Yes, ma'am. So, uh, what about over diabetes and pre gestational diabetes? Ma'am, over diabetes, if the uh, random blood sugar is more than 200 mg per cent or the fasting blood sugar is more than 126 mg per cent, it is gestational diabetes and if it is noted before uh, 24 weeks. Pardon, I, uh, your voice is not very audible. Yeah. So if it is noted? Ma'am, if you noted at the first antenatal screening only, then it is considered as. So uh, what is pre gestational diabetes? Ma'am, pre-gestational, uh, ma'am, if, um, if, if, if in gestational diabetes, then, then a normal glycemic female conceives and then during pregnancy, she becomes diabetic. But then if a diabetic female conceives, then it's known as over-diabetes or pre-gestational diabetes. So at this yeah. point, the uh, female will present with random blood sugar of more than or equal to 200 yes. mg yes. per cent. Yes. Good. So how is it means? Yeah, if the patient is already a known case of diabetes, may it be type 1 or may it be type 2, and if she conceives, then we label it as pre-gestational diabetes or over-diabetes, okay? Yes. But if the diabetes is just found in the first, first I mean, first time, for first time in the pregnancy, then we label it as gestational diabetes mellitus. Yes. But the definition itself has some fallacy. What is that? So you can miss a diagnosis prior to the pregnancy. Even an over-diabetic patient can be diagnosed for the first time in the pregnancy and can be labeled as GDM, right? Yes. There could be a chance, right? And particularly in Indian population, there is a high risk because we are under risk and most of the times we don't do pre-pregnancy counseling and checkup and we'll end up with diabetes in pregnancy, right? Yes, ma'am. 
so uh, generally speaking if, if the woman is ha- uh, having over i mean like diabetes already before pregnancy she will be under over diabetes only but if she is having impaired glucose tolerance that is like just pre diabetic range then this patient will develop gestational diabetes most commonly in the second and third trimester so if you think logically if you have to term if you have to uh, label according to the pathophysiology gestational diabetes is just because of the pregnancy which actually happens in the second and third trimester but definition is something different which includes all the diabetes uh, diagnosed in pregnancy even in the first trimester so if you diagnose pregnancy if you diagnose diabetes in first trimester may it could be mostly it could be an over diabetic case and she she must be having it before pregnancy also and if the diabetes if the levels sugar levels are very high above that uh, above the import, impaired glucose tolerance range or above gd above gdm range then also there is a chance that she is over diabetic then also we label him, we label her as over diabetic you understood yes ma'am is there any confusion in this can you repeat the last uh, what you said about that's what that's what that this is the thing you already told like see if the uh, sugar levels like fasting more than or equal to 126 if rbs is more than uh, 200 or if hba1c is more than 6.5 then she falls into over diabetic range why because if the sugars are above the diabetic above the diabetic range even in the pregnancy that infers that she is already diabetic before pregnancy and whatever diabetes she is having is not because of uh, just in, uh, gestation. gestation okay so gestational diabetes is something which is similar to impaired glucose tolerance to, uh, tolerance in non pregnant people okay yes. over diabetic is something which is equal to a diabetic range diabetes in non pregnant pe- uh, people okay yes you understood so people who are having impaired glucose tolerance uh, tolerance before pregnancy may manifest as gdm and people who, who have a, a typical diabetes will be considered as overt or pre gestational diabetes okay yes, but the yes. definition of gestational diabetes mellitus actually uh, includes whatever gestation whatever diabetes which is uh, uh, detected for the first time in pregnancy it includes both overt and also gdm okay yes. yeah so okay then fine what is the main why why we have to differentiate whether it is pre gestational or gestational diabetes why But what is depends, the main ma'am the management depends on the distinguishing like the gestational diabetes mellitus or overt in overt use um, in over diabetes if that is diagnosed then you have to start the patient on insulin but if it's gestational diabetes then you can first start the patient on medical nutrition therapy and then after two weeks evaluate and then uh, um you have okay. to... so you went straight to the uh, treatment but before that what are the Ma'am, consequences of having over diabetes and what are the uh, consequences of having gdm yeah, that sorry, is the main uh, difference uh, the gross congenital anomalies are more common in the over diabetes uh, over diabetic patients instead right. of gestational mom because organo usually gestational diabetes is uh, uh, diagnosed or it starts after 24 weeks of pregnancy by then organogenesis already occurs so there is Uh, less chances for congenital gross congenital malformation but then in over diabetes since the free radicals are present from day one of pregnancy there are more chances of risk of gross congenital malformation so what are the congenital anomalies you can expect in an over diabetic woman ma'am the most common system to be involved is the cardiovascular system um and um the most common defects are nervous system neural tube defects from in the cardiovascular system you can see ventricular septal defect atrial septal defect and trans- the uh, mm-hmm. specific um, um defect would be transposition of great vessels that is specific to diabetes like this um yes mm-hmm. other than that there is cardiac regression syndrome sleep Okay. Okay. Yeah. So you have a number of defects. So how will you tell that she is under risk? See, uh, she is under risk for all these defects. How will you? Uh, I mean, like, uh, what will you do if you get an over diabetic patient? What will you? How will you do a pre pregnancy counseling? And if she misses the pre pregnancy counseling and checkup, what will you do when she comes uh, come to you when she comes to you after becoming pregnant? Uh, ma'am, pre pregnancy you can do HPA one C level, ma'am. that time if it's more than 6.5% then you can put the patient on um, 
proper uh, glycemic control and then plan for conception. But after pregnancy, that you can the best uh, um, test to predict conservative anomalies in a diabetic mother is HbA1c again. So ideally, uh, before pregnancy, the HbA1c should be less than six point five, and during yes, pregnancy, five point seven actually. Okay. Because five point seven to six point five is also a pre-diabetic range, yes. so ideal range should be less than five point seven. And once she becomes pregnant, you have to check her HB A one C, and if it is again more, you have to start uh, treatment straight out. And if it is more than ten point five, you should advise for misc. I mean, like MTP. You should give her an option of MTP because the chances of having uh, congenital congenital anomalies is very high after ten point five. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. What else you have to monitor in an over diabetic patient? GDM, though you every everybody knows about everything, but over diabetic, you need to know what else you have to monitor. Uh, folic acid supplement. Okay. Good. What else? What are the other organs affected by diabetes? Major organs. Uh, diabetic retinopathy, diabetic nephropathy, neuropathy. All the three things have to be evaluated. Why? Pregnancy as such increases the risk of... And pregnancy as such is a diabetogenic state. So yeah. See, I know pregnancy is a diabetic, diabetogenic state, but actually pregnancy can increase the risk of diabetic nephropathy and uh, retinopathy and all. Okay. So that is the reason you, you have to evaluate them pre-pregnancy before, uh, before the pregnancy and you have to make sure that she is under regular checkups even after becoming pregnant, okay? I'm so regularly chondroscopy and uh... see if the patient no, not for all. If she if she is having those things, then you have to monitor. And pre-pregnancy, you have to evaluate her to rule out if she is having uh, diabetic retinopathy or nephropathy and neuropathy. Okay? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, you evaluate her, and if you found that she is having something like that, you monitor her. You try to treat it and also once she becomes pregnant, you have to monitor for that. Okay. Yes, yes. Just because she is diabetic, GDM, I mean, like just because she is over diabetic, uh, the only management is not controlling sugars. You have to see whether she is having any complications. Diabetic patients with over diabetic in pregnancy can land up with diabetic ketoacidosis also. Okay. Yes, so you, you should not have this monocular vision just to, to treat diabetes and to make your uh, sugars under uh, this thing. You have to see for other complications, which are generally uh, aggravated in pregnancy, like uh, retinopathy, ne uh, nephropathy and all. Okay. Yes. Ma yeah. Uh, so uh, is, that means how do we check it ma'am? Like every... Like throughout the pregnancy, we have to keep checking for keto, ketone bodies. No need of checking for ketone bodies. Yeah, see, unless until she, she is a very over diabetic and she's had an episode of ketoacidosis, she is having a, a episode of ketoacidosis in pregnancy, then you check ketone bodies. Then there, there is no particular consensus about uh, check, keep, you like you can't keep on checking for keto, ketones in the pregnancy. Okay, if you feel that her sugars are very high and she is going to ketosis, then obviously you can. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay, fine. Uh, she is over diabetic. Fine. She conceived and you control her sugars. Okay. Now over diabetes is over. Now what if she is having GDM? How will you screen a patient for GDM? What are the screening strategies you have? Uh, Dipsy. Uh, okay, you know about dipsy, dipsy only, but there are questions asking for what are the other screening strategies. Other screening strategies are not Okay, so you have ACOG, uh, ACOG guidelines, you have IADPSG guidelines, and then ours is Dipsy guideline. Dipsy is for Indian population, so that's the reason we follow Dipsy. But what does ACOG, uh, uh, I mean, like what, what is ACOG guideline regarding gestational diabetes screening? I'm not sure about ACOG. Yeah. I'll just brief it out. See, always uh, it is different. Uh, for ACOG, screening is different and diagnosis is different. So that is the reason we call it as two-step approach. In the sense, we screen the patients first with uh, 50 grams oral glucose challenge test. And if screening is positive, then we do 100 grams glucose tolerance test. That is diagnostic. Okay. Always Remember, oral glucose challenge test with 50 grams is just for screening. And if, if, she, if she is positive for the screening, 
then we have to do 100 grams glucose tolerance test which is diagnostic so that is the reason acog i mean like acog uh, screening guidelines are two uh, is labeled as two step approach means you do a screening test and if screening test is positive then you do a diagnostic test so in whom you do this acog is according to american guidelines they don't uh, they don't uh, have this high risk of diabetes in their population right so yes. that's the reason it's a selective screening so they will uh, stratif uh, stratify the patients according to the risk into low risk, average risk, and high risk. Okay. In low risk patients, obviously, there is no need of screening according to them. Okay. In average risk patients, you have to screen them at around 24 to 28 weeks. Okay. And in high risk patients, you have to screen them in first trimester as soon as she comes to you uh, after becoming pregnant and also repeat it around 24 to 28 weeks. You got it? Yes, ma'am. So the screening strategy is a selective screening strategy depending on the risk stratification and you screen only in average and high risk patients. In average risk patients, you screen at 24 to 28 weeks. In high risk patients, you screen them as soon as they become pregnant and also repeat it around 24 to 28 weeks. Okay. I'm mentioning only screening. Why? Because once you, you do screening test, like you, uh, you give 50 grams glucose at any time, ir irrespective of the fasting. And if the value is more than 140, then she is positive for the screening. And then you do 100 grams glucose tolerance test. Okay. Yes, ma'am. High risk. These are all given in your Williams, and you have to know ACOG guidelines also. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So here again, there is two. Uh, there, uh, there, there are two values. If it is more than one thirty after one, I mean, uh, after one hour, then uh, you I mean the chances of having uh, like positive pre positive predictive value is just eighty percent. If it is more than 140, then positive predictive value is more than 90%. So we take 140 as the dead, uh, deadline. And if it is more than 140, then you go for 100 grams glucose tolerance test. So do you have any idea how you do 100 grams glucose tolerance test? No, ma'am, I'm not studying. Yeah. So this is very important because this is there in your textbooks, O. Sullivan's challenge test and all. This uh, 50 grams glucose challenge test is called O. Sullivan's uh, glucose challenge test, okay? Yes. So after, uh, give, I mean, like how you do 100 grams glucose tolerance test, you ask the patient to fast for at least eight hours, okay? And not more than 10 hours. And after fasting for eight hours, you take a fasting stamp, fasting sample, and you will give 100 grams glucose to the patient, okay? And you take a one hour value, two hour value, and a three hour value, okay? Yes, and these values have a cut, also have cut off, like according to Carpenter and Coastal, everything is given in your Williams. You need not note, note down anything. And out of these four values, if any two values are abnormal, then you label, label her as gestational diabetes mellitus. Then it is a diagnostic, diagnostic, uh, diagnostic test for GDM. You understood? Yes, ma'am. So any two abnormal values out of four is, diagno is diagnostic for GDM, okay? So ACOG is very clear. It is, a, it is following two-step approach where you do a screening test first. And if it is positive only, you do a tolerance test, 100 grams to glucose tolerance test, okay? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. This is about ACOG. So what, what uh, like, see, in ACOG, the problem with uh, ACOG is the values which they have taken for diagnosis, these values are based upon the risk of developing diabetes in future. Okay, so whatever cutoff values they have given, they will tell you if the values are like they uh, they are they are mainly formulated based on the risk of having future risk um, in future diabetes and all, but yes. they are not targeted the perinatal outcome. So that's the reason we have a. HAPO study. Okay, what is HAPO study? Hyperglycemia and perinatal outcome study. So, what does this study mean? So, this study, uh, what it del what it told was just one step approach is enough. In one step approach, you give seventy five grams glucose in fasting, and you take a fasting sample, give seventy five grams glucose. You repeat the test at one hour and two hour. Okay, so this one step approach is both screening and diagnostic. You need not do any screening test uh, first and you need not go for diagnostic test if, if the screening is positive. So after, this... After performing ACOG? No, this is not ACOG guidelines. These are IADPSG guidelines. Okay. okay. 
three main guidelines are important for screening of diabetes. One is ACOG, next is IADPSG, uh, I mean, and the third one is DIPSI. Okay. So IADPSG guidelines, what they tell, only one step approach is re recommended. Means that 75 grams glucose tolerance test is for both screening and also diagnosis. Okay. You understand? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And in whom you have to do and when you have to do. So this tells you have to, no risk stratification and you have to do this 75 grams glucose tolerance test for all the patients between 24 to 28 weeks. Okay. But if the patient is high risk, then you have to do it in the first antenatal visit also. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So uh, generally high risk means all the Indian populations are under high risk because of the ethnicity and all. So for Indian population, according to IADPSG, you have to you have to screen and diagnose GDM and diabetes in the first visit, and you have to repeat at 24 to 28 weeks. So if the patient comes to you in first trimester, you can use either HbA1c or fasting glucose or RBS. But if you do RBS, you have to confirm either with HbA1c or with a fasting glucose. Okay, 75 grams glucose tolerance test need not be done in first visit. But at 24 to 28 weeks, you have to do 75 grams glucose tolerance test. You understood? Yes, ma'am. Um, could you also explain how to use that Priscilla White classification? Pardon? Ma'am, how to use the Priscilla White classification? Yeah, yeah. I'll tell that. I'll tell that. Okay. Just let me complete the screening part. Then I'll come to that. Okay? Yes, ma'am. So, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, first you do the screening with 75 grams glucose tolerance and then you have this values 92, 180, 153 and all. And if any one abnormal value is there, then you diagnose them as GDM, right? Yes. And you have DIPSI guidelines. DIPSI is according to uh, our Indian population. And what do you do in DIPSI? You know DIPSI, uh, right? Yes, so what do you explain? Ma'am, DIPSI is used to screen for everybody at the okay. first well, activity with all of it's a universal screening for all the pregnant people. When you will screen? Um, it is first antenatal visit. And then if that comes normal, then you repeat again from 24 to 28 weeks. Now. Okay. And also again at 32 to 34 weeks. So okay. what is the main advantage of DIPSI, DIPSI uh, screening? Um, the screening and diagnostic is done with one test. And yes, also please. don't there is no need for fasting. Okay, good. So there is no need for fasting. So what are the values? Uh, ma'am, values of uh, to diagnose, ma'am. Like if if the value is more than one forty, more than or equal to one forty, then it's considered gestational diabetes. Or uh, if it's from one twenty to one thirty nine, then it is gestational glucose intolerance. From one forty to two hundred is gestational diabetes mellitus, and more than two hundred is over diabetes mellitus, ma'am. Okay. Uh, okay. Fine. So the main uh, main advantage of DIPSI guidelines is it is a single step approach, like one step approach for both screening and also for diagnosis. And it is on, based on the Indian population. Okay. Yes, so that's the reason we prefer DIPSI guidelines. We follow DIPSI guidelines. Okay. Okay. Fine. You screen and you diagnose the patient with GDM. So what will you do next? Uh, screen and diagnose, ma'am. It depends on at what uh... When are you diagnosing it as uh, GDM? If at 24 weeks, if you're diagnosing it as GD, uh, GDM, then first we will uh, advise the patient for uh, medical nutritional therapy. Uh, we will um, if, uh, uh, first um, you have to evaluate her diet, ma'am, and then we'll uh, tell her about uh, split meals, small meals, and then exercise also like. Um, if she, How many minutes of exercise is recommended? Um, if she is a house, if she does household chores or regular work, she, uh, some physical labor she is doing, that is, we ask her to continue that. Otherwise, twenty minutes of brisk walking per day. Ma okay, when you uh, one fifty minutes per week, you can yes, uh, split it into thirty minutes per day for five days in a week. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yeah. So when will you advise the patient to have brisk walk after meals or before before meals? After meal, because if it's before meal, hypoglycemia. Yes, yes. Okay, so how will you monitor during? Uh, so, how long will you advise medical nutrition therapy? Well, for two weeks, we have to, uh, only, we only advise for uh, medical nutrition therapy and exercise. After that, we reevaluate the glucose. And if it is more, uh, 
less than 120, then we can count on um, we can continue with medical nutrition therapy. So, and what are the target sugars you you uh, expect? What are the target sugars uh, for uh, monitoring? Target sugars like if a patient is on insulin, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, if the patient is not on insulin, she is on medical nutrition therapy. How will you tell? How will you escalate her for next? Ma'am, if the patient is just on medical nutrition therapy, then the target sugar is less than 120 hours postprandial. At, at how many hours? At two hours, ma'am. Yeah. If it is one hour, how much is the value? At one hour, I am not sure. Yeah. If it is one hour, it should be less than 140. If it is two hours, it should be less than 120. And for fasting, the target uh, sugar should be less than 95. Okay. And if she's not able to achieve these target values with two weeks of medical nutrition therapy, then obviously you will escalate for? Ma'am, either oral hypoglycemic drugs or... You want to give oral hypoglycemic drugs? Are they recommended? Uh, Ma'am, now I read the recent guidelines say that bubenclamide and uh, metformin are not contraindicated in pregnancy. Oh, so if it is... The... What, are the, what, what, are the, what does the... What does the... What What does the guideline actually tell? Not sure about that. ACOG guidelines tells that, see, there is no wrong in giving metformin and glyburide in pregnancy, but it clearly states that it crosses the placenta. So we never know the long run, long term consequences. That's Although right. the, the studies have only uh, uh, shown the short term consequences, but we never know how the child is after some 12 years or seven years of uh, birth. As such, the studies are very limited regarding the long-term consequences. So they are not recommended, but they are still safe in pregnancy, but they're not recommended because they lack long-term studies. Okay? okay. And the main disadvantage with oral hypoglycemic drugs is they cross placenta. Yes. So if a drug crosses placenta and if it goes to the fetus, do you want to give it to you <coughs> give it to your patient? Uh Ma'am, if we have a better option, then we don't have to. Yes, of course. Insulin is a better option. Of course, it is a tedious process and patient uh, sugars fluctuates, risk of hypoglycemia, everything is there. But compared to teratogenic effect and long term, if you don't have something, uh, if you don't have any long term consequences, studies and all, then you can't be sure, right? Patients yes. can come and sue you also in future. Nowadays, patients are well educated. So you should be always cautious in giving oral hypoglycemic drugs, even though they are safe. I mean, because the safety is only up to short term level, only studies are uh, showing uh, up to a short term level. The studies regarding long term safety is not, I mean, are not at uh, come. Okay, have not at come. Next. Okay, so fine. You have started her on insulin because patient's uh, diabetes is not under control with medical nutrition therapy. Okay. Yes, so, what insulin you would prefer? Ma'am, uh, mixed start insulin with 37. Mixed start in pregnancy, is it preferable? Um, what are the insulins you know? From regular insulin, short acting, then MPH insulin, and that time that's long acting. Mm -hmm. Then um, there's also aspart and dispro. Yeah, okay, okay, ultra short acting, fine. So here the problem with mixtard is you in, in mixture, what is what is the composition of mixtard? From 3070 mixture is uh, yeah. What type of insulin uh, is there in mixed start? Um, both normal and short acting. Intermediate acting and short acting insulins will be there in mixed start. Okay, so if you want to, if the patient is, uh, if you can't regulate your dosage as you do in uh, normal human act rapid and all. Okay, so, in human act rapid, you give sh uh, short acting insulin at each and every meal so that you can adjust the dose. Of yes. the insulin which you give to the patient. In mixed up, once you give in the morning, you can't adjust the dose in between, right? You have to give it in the night and you have to adjust the dose next day. So yes. rather than giving mixed up, uh, human, I mean, act rapid or regular insulin is better. And for, uh, so how will you give uh, regular insulin? You will see the patient, you will start with a minimal dose and how will you monitor her? Uh, Ma'am, regular insulin like about four to six minutes per day. Uh, in the beginning we started. Um, I'm not sure about regular insulin. Next third, I had read that if the blood sugar you have to monitor every third day, and then if in case the um, fa fasting blood sugar is high, then you increase the night dose, and if the postprandial blood sugar is high, then you increase the 
Okay. Okay. See how it goes. I'll tell you. So yes. you give regular insulin or actropic, whatever it is. You start with minimal dose, two units or four units, depending on your convenience. And actually, there is a dose calculation for that also. Okay. Point one and the dose, uh, I mean, like point one international units per kg, something. I don't remember exactly. So generally speaking, we started two units or four units per uh, per meal, and you ask her to take fifteen minutes before meal, and uh, she'll have meal, and then she'll check postprandial. Okay, and if the postprandial is raised, you have to see how what is the diet she has taken, what is and what, how much of insulin she is taking. So you can adjust the dose according to the diet in the next day or for the next meal. You understood? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, and uh, this insulin, short-acting insulin, will control only postprandial sugars. short acting insulin in the night will not control the fasting sugar the next day okay so okay. to control the fasting sugars next day you give intermediate or long acting insulin in the night okay what is the intermediate uh, uh, acting insulin uh, isofen yeah nph right ma'am is this the double mixed regimen ma'am double mixed regimen i don't know what exactly the name is but generally we give a uh, regular acting insulin com uh, combined with uh long acting insulin in the night yes ma'am long acting or intermediate acting previously they used to give intermediate acting but now everybody is giving long acting nobody is relying on intermediate acting uh and you give long acting insulin in the night okay uh so generally previously they used to give mixed start but now the regimen the trend is to give short acting insulin and with a long acting insulin in the night okay thank you ma'am yeah so how will you monitor if you monitor you monitor as uh, you monitor generally Uh, four times per day morning fasting and post meals each and every day each and every meal after each meal okay so once you reach the target then there is no point of uh, i mean monitoring four times per day then you can monitor either fasting and one as uh, a fasting and either of the uh, either of three post meals you understood yes ma'am fasting and either of the meals yeah yeah may it be post breakfast or post lunch or post dinner okay yes ma'am yeah and uh, you have to uh, review them weekly okay so you have monitored everything you have done so how will you uh, do obstetric okay her sugars are under control and all okay fine so what are the complications you expect in a gdm patient maternal or fetal complications you have to tell me okay sorry ma'am mm -hmm. um uh, fetal complications if it's a in, in gdm uh, fetal complications are because of macrosomia Uh, there could be a uh, shoulder dystocia, and because of the so shoulder dystocia, the fetus like most common fetal complication is Erb's paralysis, and for maternal it's postpartum hemorrhage. There can also be um unexplained stillbirth in diabetic pregnancy, um, and uh, uh, also because of the hyperinsulin state, there'll be delayed. Uh, there won't be majority of the surfactant, so there could be respiratory distress in the upon birth. and then neonatal how can you prevent respiratory distress uh, uh by administering cortisone good okay so when will you administer uh, i'm not sure but i'll keep reading in these pa uh, reports that the patient is dead steroided yeah so generally there is no point of giving steroids before 28 weeks because surfactant is not formed and fetal lungs are not enough uh, matured so we have to give it 28 but it is not universal for all if you feel that the patient is under preterm or if the patient is under uh, risk of preterm delivery then only you give and particularly in diabetic women you have to be cautious because steroids themselves can elevate the sugars right yes sir. so you have to monitor her sugars and then you have to titrate the dose of insulin when she was on betnazol okay yes, okay so what what are the other precautionary things you take in a gdm patient Other precautions, ma'am. Mm -hmm. So during labor, ma'am. During antenatal period, I am not talking about labor and postpartum. Mm -hmm. Other than exercise and diet. And... No, how will you do a uh, fetal monitoring in a GDM patient? Ah, uh, fetal monitoring. What are the main points where you see? Uh, if the patient is diabetic, obviously the risk of anomalies could be there. If she is, because she there is a chance that she could be an over diabetic. So you have to make sure that she is she has undergone aneuploidy screening, and yes. she has undergone anomaly scan and fetal echo. Okay, yes. fetal echo between twenty to twenty four weeks is also must because the risk of congenital anomalies could be there. Yes, 
okay and you have to start antepartum fetal surveillance at 32 weeks because GDM, yeah gdm is a risk factor for sudden iud right yes. so you have to uh, you have to, and also other complications pregnancy related complications iugr everything right yes. also big baby also iugr okay yes. So you have to start antepartum fetal surveillance right at 32 weeks. And you have to monitor her, monitor fetal growth every four weekly because the risk of macrosomia could be there. Yes okay. or no? Um, also, how do we advise the patient for fetal, daily fetal count? Pardon? Fetal Pardon? Fetal Pardon? Fetal what? Um, how do we advise? Like in the report, I read daily fetal count uh, Check so what is the what are the fetal i mean like uh, how do you do antepartum fetal surveillance what are the tests you know to do antepartum fetal surveillance what um, is the main aim of doing antepartum fetal surveillance uh, to, to check antepartum fetal surveillance what does it mean it means uh, to check whether the fetus is good or not okay you are you are doing a surveillance uh, in the antepartum period that's what the name indicates right so how do you do either by fetal uh, movement or by doing nst or you have so many tests for that biophysical profile and all okay but generally the most easiest thing and convenient thing to do is fetal movement chart okay so you 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 have to do daily fetal movement charting Okay, that is recommended for all. It is universal recommendation to do daily fetal movement charting. If the if there is any decreased fetal movements, obviously she has to report and we will evaluate further. Okay, the fetal antepartum fetal surveillance first and foremost thing you ask the patient to do is the uh, daily fetal movement chart. And this GDM patient all we all better to do antepartum fetal surveillance with NST also starting at thirty two weeks. Yes. You understood. Yes, yeah. This is about fetal monitoring. What about maternal monitoring in diabetes? Okay. So if the patient is already over diabetic, I told you she'll be, uh, I mean, like if she has a risk of uh, diabetic retinopathy or diabetic uh, nephropathy, obviously pregnancy will aggravate that. And you have to actually speaking according to guidelines, diabetic retinopathy should be checked each and every trimester. Okay, once in every trimester. So three times she has to be checked for diabetic retinopathy if she is over diabetic, not for GDM cases. You understood? Yes. Yeah. Um, and thyroid, thyroid, HPA1C. I mean, like the sugar, diabetic control, you just leave it. Thyroid, obviously, you can do. And for diabetic retinopathy, she has to be monitored with serum creat and urine albumin creat ratio in each and every trimester. Okay. This is for yes, over diabetic. Yes, Can you please repeat that? Pardon? Ma'am, can you please repeat that, ma'am? Yes, yeah, serum creat or urine albumin creat ratio. You can do renal parameter testing if she is under risk for diabetic retinopathy or if she is a known case of diabetic retinopathy. So all these are for over diabetic women. Okay. Yes, but GDM as such, maternal complications are less. Fetal complications are also uh, fetal complications are more. But over diabetic maternal complications are also more, and fetal complications are also more. You understood? Yes, yes, so if the patient is over diabetic, you have to monitor her also because pregnancy can increase the risk of uh, again diabetic retinopathy and diabetic uh, nephropathy and all. Okay, so you have to monitor her renal parameters and you have to check for diabetic retinopathy each and every trimester according to guidelines. Okay. I have a doubt about maternal complications. I read that in um, diabetic females, there is more risk for hyperemesis gravidarum. Why is that now? See, hyperemesis gravidarum is in uh, like uh, what to tell unexplored entity you how much ever you you see you never know what could be the main cause of course a high hcg and all and if the patient is specifically having any other complications obviously the risk for hyperemesis gravidarum will increase it's 10 o'clock hello yes ma'am yeah. and uh, i forgot to tell you one more point uh, if the patient is having severe diabetic retinopathy before pregnancy or in the first trimester it is one of the indication for uh, uh, suggesting MTP also. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Because the risk of maternal complications will be more in pregnancy. Okay, fine. Uh, so now you have monitored everything. Now coming to intrapartum monitoring. I mean, like how will you, so timing of delivery. When will you want to deliver the patient? Um, I actually have a doubt in that, ma'am. Um, mm -hmm. In one of the previous GDM presentations on YW, the maternal mentioned that 
if it is if the patient has been managed by medical nutrition therapy itself then you can wait until expected delivery date if in case the patient is on insulin then 38 weeks uh, termination is advised but if the patient has any associated uh, a problem like preeclampsia or previous history of stillbirth or vasculopathy then much earlier from 34 to 36 weeks but in the textbook it says that um, the time of delivery it should never be delivered in early term period from 37 to 38 plus 6 days because of defective surfactant insulation so what yeah so here you have to always uh, weigh the risks and benefits if the if the patient is having a good control good uh, diabetic control and if the patient is on medical nutrition therapy with good diabetic control she can be delivered like normal other persons around 39 to 41 weeks okay if the patient is on insulin and if she is having good, good control 39 to 40 is what recommended okay yes. but if the patient is having poor control even with insulin then it they should be delivered after term so, you know, after term is after 37 weeks, early term, term and late term are there. So after uh, term means 37 to 39 weeks, you have to deliver. So in early term, you, de you early term patients, you deliver, time you deliver. Okay. And if there is any, uh, if the patient is having uh, in failed control and if there is any abnormal fetal testing, so you can uh, deliver them at 34 to 37 weeks, which is late preterm. Okay. Okay, so if there is any, any other comorbidities associated, then you deliver at late preterm at 34 to 37. If she is having poor control, you deliver them as at, at early term after 37 and before 39. And if she is on insulin with good control at 39 to 40, and if she is like medical nutrition therapy, then with good control, you can deliver like a normal, you can treat her like a normal patient only. Okay, yes. this is what, this is according to ACOG guidelines. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. And when will you suggest cesarean section? Uh, it, it's a macrosomic cesarean section. Above how many, how many grams? Uh, 4,000 grams. 4,500 grams. Yes. Okay. So how will you, how will you monitor? Okay. This is too much. I mean, like you are MBBS, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So what are the main precautions you take in, uh, in labor? In labor precautions, ma'am, you do urine testing for ketone bodies, serum electrolytes, blood, uh, and then um, you also do blood sugar levels. And then you'll ask the patient to skip the um, uh, insulin on the previous day. And on the, the night time, usual night time dose can be taken, bedtime dose can be taken, but the morning dose should be withheld. Okay, okay. We can. Yeah. And then okay. now you start. And you have to monitor the blood glucose, uh, um, uh, serum blood I'm glucose. Blood glucose monitoring, ma'am. Yeah, intrapartum blood glucose monitoring should be done. Okay, fine. Patient delivered. What is the postpartum monitoring you do? Uh, postpartum monitoring. Uh, you don't need my See, if the patient is a GDM patient on uh, medical nutrition therapy or if she is clear-cut GDM, actually you need not monitor because once the, pregnant, once the pregnancy is over, her uh, levels come, will come down to normal. For over-diabetic, you need to follow up the levels because they will be uh, in the diabetic range and they need treatment after pregnancy also. Okay, So generally speaking, you check uh, APS and PPBS after three days. And after six weeks, you, uh, you six weeks and one year, you do 75 grams glucose tolerance test. And then you have to check annual FBS also. And every three yearly, you have to check 75 gram glucose tolerance test. These are according to guidelines, but generally we don't follow that. We'll just do FBS, FBS and PPBS after three days and we can repeat at GTT at seven, six weeks. Okay. okay, six weeks postpartum. So what are the what are the risks, long-term consequences for her? I mean, like how will you manage a neonate born to GDM mother? Ma'am, uh, a neonate born to GDM mother is one of the risks is birth asphyxia. So okay. that has to, and then you have to also look for any congenital malformations. Okay. And also the baby is at risk for neonatal hypoglycemia because of the intrauterine hyperinsulinemia. What is that called? What is that hypothesis called? Uh feathers. Pedersen hypothesis. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, I wasn't sure about pronunciation. Sorry. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. And okay. then also, all the babies should receive one milligram of vitamin K intramuscularly. That is universal. That is not specific to GDM. Baby. And also, if it's a macrosomic baby, you don't have to do delayed cord clamping. In, in that case, you can do early cord clamping because of the uh, it could have uh, polycythemia. 
Yes, policy I think may come to your risk. Yes, yes. yes and another guideline to prevent neonatal hypoglycemia would be to start breastfeeding within 30 minutes, ma'am. Okay. Mm -hmm. So and the no, major risk factor here is uh, they'll have all like, they they can have electrolyte abnormalities and yes, most important thing and dangerous thing is hypoglycemic attacks. So they should yes, be monitored because patient may I mean uh, neonate may have hypoglycemic attack also and it can go unrecognized also right. Yes, they can't, so that's the reason they should be monitored. Okay. Yeah, and coming to your Priscilla and White classification, uh, that is just a classification of diabetes, uh, depending on the onset of diabetes. If it is gestational, again, A1 and A2, if she's on diet or insulin. And if it is pre-gestational, again, it depends on the duration of diabetes and all. Okay, so that's not very relevant in nowadays. Uh, the main classification we follow is generally pre-gestational and gestational diabetic classification. That's it. Okay. okay. Yeah. Any doubts you have? I think I asked them on during the class okay. itself. Okay. okay, that was a nice presentation. Yeah, uh, okay, then fine. We'll wind uh, up. I have one more question. Um, um, at term, if the if you first uh, di diagnosing the gestational diabetes matters at term, ma'am, what is the protocol to be followed? The same. Even if it is at term, you have to uh, do the same, right? What else but, you want to uh, change? I mean, like, what is the doubt? See, if she's under term, you can start, I mean, like, see, term means uh, if she, depending on the gestational age, actually, if you diagnose it uh, uh, after term, like after 37 weeks and her sugars are not under control, you can deliver her also, actually. Because if she, at, after 37 weeks, the, the maturity is fine, right? She can be labeled as early term. At the same time, you have to do a strict sugar control also. Same medical nutrition therapy has to be followed. And once she is into labor, you have to monitor her sugars. And if she started on insulin, depending on the sugars, it always depends on the gestational age and also sugars. How elevated are the sugars? If the sugars are very high, you need not wait for medical nutrition therapy to act. And well, you can start insulin and you can take for lab, I mean, like uh, induction also. Um, one more question. It says in unexplained stillbirth, the death rate given is because the O2 requirement is high. Is it because of the increased somatic growth, ma'am? Huh? Pardon, I didn't get your question. In unexplained, one of the risks in uh, one of the fetal risks they give as unexplained stillbirth, ma'am. In yes. uh, is it because they and the explanation for that was given as increased O2 requirement, so there may be hypoxia in the baby. Yes, of Why course. Why is there this increased uh, O2 requirement, ma'am? Is it because it's a big baby or because of increased somatic? Yeah, see, uh, of course, one of the cause could be increased, uh, I mean, like, I mean, because of the macrosomia or uh, increased fetal weight, uh, high gestational weight, I mean, like high birth weight, I mean, like if it is intrauterine, we can't tell it is high birth weight, if might be because of the large for gestational age baby. Uh, also, large for gestational age baby can be under risk for hypoxia and can be under risk for hypoglycemia also. Pregnancy, in pregnancy, the sugars in mother also can vary, right? So obviously, a uh, uh, baby will be under risk for hypoglycemia. And because of the Pedersen hypothesis, you can expect hypoglycemic, hypoglycemic attacks in the baby also. And hypoxia can be there. It could be because of the large first gestational age or it could be because of the uh, other I mean, uh, factors like placental factors. Sometimes we expect that, okay, large first gestational age babies are expected in GDM, but there could be a placental pathology in GDM uh, mothers, which can also lead to hypoxia. Thank you, ma'am. And also, one more doubt. Um, if, like in a normal pregnancy, and we learned that until 28 weeks, it's monthly visit, and until 36 weeks, bi monthly, and after that, weekly. So, how does, how does the antenatal visit change the schedule change after, like, if, the, if at 24 weeks she's diagnosed as gestation? That's what, that's what I told, no? It depends on her management. If it is a medical nutrition therapy, you monitor her sugars and call her after two weeks. And if the sugars are not normal, you have to start on insulin. And once she's on insulin, you have to review her every two weekly. Till her sugars are under control, you have to review her weekly. Uh, and if sugars are under control, uh, then you have to do a daily fasting and postprandial, at least any of the one postprandial, and you have to review the values every uh, uh, two weekly. And these are according to ACOG guidelines and it depends on the guidelines and your own hospital protocols. Thank you so much, ma'am. I'll just check the um, YouTube yeah. ones for doubts.
I'm kin the uh Janet Manoj is asking, Madam, our pathogenesis are of complications due to HPM. H human ma'am, what are the pathogenesis and complications due to human placental lactogen? See, human placental lactogen here is one of the reason, one of the uh, logical explanation to tell pregnancy is a diabetogenic state. You understood why pregnancy is a diabetic a diabetogenic state? Ma'am, because um, most most of the glucose is uh, the the fetus is entirely depend on the mother for glucose, so most of the glucose is di diverted to the fetus. So. No, I am asking why the pregnancy is a diabetogenic state. Because of the progesterone hormone, progesterone ha hormone actually uh, causes diabetogenic state and uh, insulin sensitivity also, increases, insulin resistance increases. All this happen because, I mean, like uh, there is a theory telling that placenta, whatever hormones uh, the placenta secretes, like mostly human placental lactogen, also has a role in causing all this insulin resistance and all. Okay. So, as such, pregnancy is a diabetogenic state because of the progesterone hormone and also some of the hormones like this secreted from the placenta. Understood? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So that's the reason pregnancy is prone for diabetes. Why? Because progesterone actually is a diabetogenic hormone and also because uh, act, insulin sensitivity decreases in pregnancy and because of the hormones produced from the placenta, like placental lactogen and all. Thank you, ma'am. I think that covered his doubt. Yeah. Okay, then. Fine. Yeah. That was a good Thank you, yeah. Thank Any you so much, ma'am. Okay. I'll conclude this. Um, just before we end, uh, we started this new um, new protocol in which the mentor tells us what they would expect of a student in the final exam as a um, like MBBS final exam and also as an intern. Like, what would you expect the student to know specific to this case or like specific to this problem? Yeah. So specific to this case, see, for an MBBS student, I, I would like to know what is the definition of uh, GDM and basics. What are the consequences of GDM? You he or she should be able to differentiate an over diabetes and gestational diabetes because everything, all the consequences and uh, treatment, everything differs, right? So yes. he or she should know what is the uh, effect of over diabetes on pregnancy? What is the effect of GDM on pregnancy? And what is the basic screening test and diagnostic test for pregnancy at least if you don't know the guidelines which were quoted in textbook just he or she should be able to tell the guidelines which they are following because in india most of the centers will follow dipsy guidelines we are not aware of acoj also but your william standard textbooks like williams and all will quote the acoj guidelines so better to know this at least challenge test and screening test what is a screening test what is a diagnostic test and I would not expect them to know uh, the actual treatment and management of this thing, but I expect them to know how they monitor the fetus because antepartum fetal surveillance is what you have to know after reading obstetrics, right? So I don't want them to know the medical part of the treatment, but I just expect them to know the obstetric management in a GDM case when to deliver and the mode of delivery and postpartum management. That's it. Thank you, ma'am. And as an intern, what would you expect us to know, ma'am, when if this patient came? Like, what would you expect from an intern as something? So, as a mentor, I would expect, I mean, from you, right? Yes, for the case presentation, yeah. So, I mean, like, you are up to mark according to uh, your uh, this thing because you are a fourth year student, and I'm happy with the presentation. Thank and uh, yeah, I mean, like, see. Just because you're fourth or fifth year doesn't mean that you, you need not know all the things and all, but basics you should be able to answer. And in case presentation, you should be, see, whatever you present, you should uh, substantiate it. See, there is no hard and fast rule in medicine and all. Okay. You, if you, if you tell one point, you should be, you should stick on to it and you should be able to uh, explain why you have told the point. For suppose, if you mentioned that a scan is done, or if you suppose you mentioned that so and so test is done, you should be able to uh, justify your uh, this thing, your presentation. I I don't want any perfect presentation, but I just want you to be sure that whatever you presented, you will you know that, and you uh, you have a specific reason why you have mentioned that point. Thank you, 
and don't take unnecessarily uh, to some other things okay if you dig out medical medicine is endless you can uh, you can uh, uh, end with some other topic also so just confine yourself with the topic and make sure you get a proper uh, discussion about each and everything it's not just discussing one part and stopping the other part from right from the etiology till the management in each and every trimester and delivery and postpartum everything should be covered so make sure your discussion should be like that and your discussion should include basics basics of obstetrics because whatever the case is basics of obstetrics like grips and all and uh, history taking should be perfect and after that whatever case you are taking should be discussed okay i am one more thing when when asked the question what is the routine investigations expected in all anc visits what should the answer be yeah so that is a very big uh, topic again so uh, because see it if you talk according to the guidelines guidelines are always different see for suppose if uh, cbc urine routine should be repeated in each and every trimester accordingly and regarding other evaluation like serum creat and all see thyroid thyroid is not an universal screening thing but we do universal screening we do thyroid for everybody we do yes. <coughs> sorry we do a serum creat and all so generally speaking just minute <coughs> sorry yeah bless you doctor yeah thank you yeah so uh, again it depends you, you can there is no specific guidelines telling that this is universal screening this is selected screening i told you about the screening of diabetes when you can when you come to diabetes in indian population we are under risk for diabetes so you have to do universal screening for all for thyroid there is no specific guidelines telling that it should be universal screening but we do universal screening and what are the other things you do for uh, universal you do serology for sure you do uh, uh, routine bloods uh, like Uh, CBC and urine routine and all, and blood grouping is universal. So there are few things which are always there, okay, and few other things which your hospital do. For suppose, few people will do LFT, RFT for all in each and every trimester. So that depends on your hospital protocols. You should be able to substantiate that we are doing like this, okay. Um, what about Pap smear and the streptococcal B swab? streptococcal is again a different scenario that that has its own indications when to do depending on a prior, prior pregnancy you have to do so gbs screening is totally different that we'll sub- discuss separately in some other class and regarding pap smear also there is no specific consensus telling that it is a universal screening okay and also aneuploidy should be mentioned in the question ma'am when asked in which question a routine investigation do we mention aneuploidy yeah aneuploidy screening actually uh, to be specific it is not a universal screening it is a uh, it is again a static i mean like a specific screening like if the patient is under risk you do that is not that is not a universal screening as such because we have a uh, we have a, uh, this thing uh, we can do those things we are doing that's it i told you no even an early pregnancy scan is not a universal scan you need not do uh, it's not a universally done uh, thing you have to do if there is only specific indication you can go through williams and you can see the indications for early pregnancy scan 